Heidi, I think none of us uh, enters into parenthood thinking, gosh, I hope I raise a selfish kid. But you and I both know how easy it is to start down that road. And before you know it, you got one. And I think it's really good meaning parenting Mm -hmm. that does raise a selfish child. Mm -hmm. You know, we are told to do all of these things to encourage our children and praise our kids, but the result can be very dangerous and damaging. So today we're going to take a look at six, I'll I'll call them points or tips, how you would unintentionally, we'll say, raise a selfish child. And then we're going to kind of process through some thoughts that we have on how to avoid that. Welcome back to Parenting to Impress, your go-to podcast to learn practical ways to love God and love others and impress this on the hearts of your children. I am your host, Heidi Franz, and I am joined by my dear friend, Melanie Simpson, two moms who have made a lot of mistakes, but have found grace and truth along the way. So Melanie, this list of six tactics was actually created by Love & Logic. And it's kind of the reverse because normally we give the positive and talk about it, but this is the reverse. If you want to create selfish kids, these are the six things to do. What we're encouraging you to do is the exact same thing that we did when we read through this list. And as we've been processing it and preparing for this podcast is thinking through each one of these and going, am I intentionally or unintentionally doing this? Not for you to be overwhelmed, because it can be easy, it can be very easy to get overwhelmed with this list, but for you to just kind of do a heart check yeah. on your parenting. Yeah. And it's a great starting point. I mean, when you hear these points, just be thinking like, okay, where do we fall? And you know, where, where are the places that we can have some improvement? Perfect. All right. Number one, if you want to raise a selfish child, give that child constant praise. That's surprising because um, like you said, culturally, um, and I think it's just in our hardwiring as parents, Mm -hmm. we want to praise our kids, Mm -hmm. right? We want to tell them they're doing a great job. So what's the downside? The problem is constant praise produces a very selfish child. Mm. It is a child who is focused totally on themselves. So as we're going to do in every single podcast, let's go back to what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. Right. So I I love the Westminster Catechism. And Mm -hmm. number one is what is the chief end of man? Mm -hmm. And the response is the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's not to glorify myself. It's not to make a big deal about myself. It's to praise God. So if from the get go, a child receives constant praise, Mm -hmm. who do you think they're going to grow up to praise? Right. Themselves. They see themselves as the reason for every good that comes out Mm -hmm. instead of seeing that God gave them the gifts, God gave them the abilities, and these are to be used for his glory. So where we mess up is when we give our kids praise instead of teaching them to give that praise and honor to God. God says that our identity should be in him alone, and we are to praise him not what he has created. Right. So we're not saying don't praise your kids. Exactly. We're saying that when uh, little Sally, you know, draws a beautiful picture, Mm -hmm. you praise the creator's gift in her. Mm -hmm. Look at how God used you and your brain and your skills Mm -hmm. to draw that beautiful rainbow. What would be another example, Heidi? Well, I think we, we are going to acknowledge the child's hard work acknowledge the child's perseverance, their focus and their creativity. But we also want to point them to the creator that gave them these abilities. So another example with a teen is, man, I see how hard you are working on this science project. God sees how hard Mm -hmm. you're working. Yeah. And I am praying that you are going to be able to see God working through you in this. Yeah. And I just want to make a note. This kind of came to me when you were saying that. I think mm-hmm. about um, parents of kiddos who have um, special needs, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we might have a child who is wheelchair bound. How? Right. Yeah. How, how can we appropriately praise that child so that they know that in spite of or, you know, despite any challenges, mm-hmm. they are st- still fearfully and wonderfully made? Absolutely. And so, you know, just being being thoughtful that um, it is 
an easy trap to fall into, um, but that when we look to the heart of the child and how God has created them, um, we really do give them such a stronger sense of identity than in the outward things. I'm pretty, my dress is pretty, you know, my picture is good, whatever it is. Well, praise is performance based. Mm, yes. And so what happens is when you are constantly praising that child on what they are doing or how they look, what happens when they're no longer the most beautiful and they realize it? Yeah, yeah. Because there is a point in every single one of our lives when we realize, oh, wow, I am not the most beautiful person in the world. You know, I am not the fastest runner. I am not the best basketball player because there is always somebody who is better. And even if you are first place, there's always somebody who's going to break your record. I mean, watch the Olympics. Yeah. And so we want to teach that child that it is who, not what. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so let's look at number two. Number two is ensuring that the child is always the center of attention. Yeah, that will create a selfish child. And as with constant praise, society tells us that children must be heard and listened to at all times. You know, we don't want a child to not be heard because maybe that would hurt their feelings mm -hmm. or maybe that would squash their thought process. And, but what happens is when we are giving that child the center of attention all the time, that child's going to start demanding the center of attention. And that runs absolutely counter with what God tells us that we're to love others. Yeah. And I would say it goes hand in hand with the constant praise. It just, it, the child then becomes an idol, mm -hmm. an idol to him or herself and in your family. I mean, if you have to stop everything mm -hmm. to give that child attention, mm -hmm. who is running your family? Well, and what's going to happen if you have an only child and suddenly you have another child in your family? How are you going to get both of them center of attention? Then you get a battle between siblings. Mm -hmm. And you create unwanted competition, and then you, you, you've created a whole nother level. Right. And I mean, just think about that child then moving into the school world and work world. Mm -hmm. uh, you won't be the center of attention. Right. I mean, it's not going to last forever. And so you're setting that child up for failure. Right. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 9. If you've been to one of the ABC Jesus Loves Me conferences, you know this is a common scripture that I go to because we are called to love others. So I want you to think about a child who is constantly the center of attention. Is that child going to learn to be patient? Is that child going to learn to wait while other people are talking? Love is kind. And is that child going to learn how to be kind? Love also does not boast and love is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's, it is not self-seeking. And there is nothing loving about a child who demands to be heard. Mm -hmm. So when we go back to God's definition of love based on 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 9, we can automatically see that making a child the center of attention is not going to create a child who is loving. Right. And so, you know, one of the practical tips is training your child not to interrupt. Mm -hmm. That indicates to the child that, yes, I, I, I want to be heard and that's okay. Right. But there is an appropriate time in which to be heard. Yeah. You're validating that they have something to say, but you are not placing what they have to say above anybody else. Yeah. So this is very, very simple, but something that we did with the kids is if I was talking, let's say I'm talking to you, Melanie. And one of my children have something to say to me. I train them to come up, put their arm on my shoulder. I would place my hand on top of their arm and hand so that then they knew I knew they were there. And then when we had a pause in our conversation, then I would talk with the child. So they were able to get my attention and I acknowledged them without being rude or disrespectful. Number three. If you want to raise a selfish child, make sure that the child never encounters any hardships. Yeah, I think it is a great challenge for all parents. None of us want to see our kids struggle. None of us want to see our kids meet up against a circumstance, whether self-inflicted or otherwise, right. that they 
can't get through. Yeah. And I would say, Melanie, that's been one of the hardest things about raising teens. As little kids, I could more manipulate what the hardships were because Mm -hmm. they were little. Mm -hmm. Now there's so many outside forces that I can't control. And what this particular tip is saying, don't try to control it. Yeah. I mean, it is um, an unfortunate part of the human experience that we will encounter hardships, trials. They're part of our lives. Yeah. I mean, however, whatever phrase you want to use, but Mm -hmm. we're, they're going to come and we do our kids a disservice by not training them how to get through them. So that starts when they're little, when, like you said, the stakes aren't as high, right? And you, we can, we can actually intentionally create obstacles if mm-hmm. we need to. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think most kids will come upon them naturally, yeah. you know, training them how to overcome those things prepares them for those teen years. We won't be able to fix everything, but they will have had a little bit of experience and they know you're on their side, right? Yes, you're, yeah. you're on their team. Maybe you're not going to swoop in to fix it, but you can, you can be there to cheer them along. Yeah. According to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, anxiety disorders affect 31.9% of adolescents between the ages of 13 and 18. That is one in three children, teens, are going to struggle with an anxiety disorder. Now, Melanie, there are multiple factors in this, and I'm not going to um, blame this statistic on any one thing, but there are some that feel that at least some of this percentage is attributed to parents not allowing their children to encounter hardships. Sure. I mean, imagine you are now in high school, right? Mm -hmm. And your entire life, anything that popped up Mm -hmm. was immediately taken care of for Mm -hmm. you. Then you're getting ready to launch into harder issues. Like you said, you know, more significant hardships and your parents can't fix things for you. I mean, they simply cannot do it anymore. Right how is that going to leave you feeling? If it were me, I would be anxious, worried, fretful. Those are the human feelings that pop up when we encounter something that is making us scared that we can't overcome. Right. Let's talk about some real life examples of how to allow your child to encounter hardships. Okay. Okay? So I'm thinking of a toddler sitting on the floor playing with maybe a sorting toy where they're trying to put the triangle block into the circle hole and they're getting frustrated. And as parents, we have, I think about three choices. Number one, walk in and take the toy because we don't want to see the child's frustrated. Okay. Number two, walk in and just do it for the child. And so then the child's frustration stops. But the problem with that is we never train the child how to work through it. And then the third choice that I think is best is helping the child be successful in that frustration, helping the child see that you can try different ways, that maybe you need to set it down and come back to it. Maybe you need to ask for help, but giving the child tools to be able to be successful during that hardship. Yeah, I love that. And it perfectly models that coming alongside the child, Yes, um, you know, at an early age and gives them an opportunity to, to see like, I'm here with you. I'm going to, I'm going to help you get through this yes. and I'm going to give you tools to be able to be successful, right. not do it for you, right. but I'm here with you. And that goes on into elementary and, and older, um, you know, it, making, re, you know, helping remind a child to make a lunch the night before. Mm-hmm. So they're not flustered in the morning trying to get out mm-hmm. the door. Mm-hmm. Um, Heidi, you and I both have lots of stories about kids and alarm clocks and <laughs> the hardships that occur when mm-hmm. um, alarm clocks are not set or they are right. ignored. Once that training has occurred, then we have to be willing as parents to allow natural consequences to happen. So if the child has been trained how to make a lunch, they forget to make their lunch and it's, this has become a pattern that they're forgetting to make their lunch and take it with them then we allow them not to have a lunch. Mm -hmm. And we'll actually get more um, in depth with this at another point about consequences. But Mm -hmm. here, let's end this little piece here by saying, 
all of these hardships and and walking through hardships with our with our kids are opportunities to let them see God at work. Mm-hmm. That could be God at work in them, refining them and maturing their faith. It could be God at work in somebody else. It could be God at work in a situation. Mm-hmm. So just it is a constant opportunity to reflect on how is the Lord interacting in our lives because he is a personal relational God. And taking it the next step then is them seeing how they need to depend on God yeah, and seeing their need for God in every single circumstance. And I would just say too, Heidi, that, that goes back to us as parents too. Mm -hmm. You know, as our kids get older, we can remind them, look, I love you so much. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, my heart is breaking that you're encountering this hardship, but I am called by the Lord to train you up and, and to, you know, be able to release you as a productive adult. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm called to do. I'm called to trust Mm -hmm. God in this situation. And how many times have I had a conversation with a child where they've been upset with me and I have gone, you know what? I'm doing what God has told me to do. I know you don't like this, but if I don't do what I'm doing, then I'm not obeying God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What's the next point? Buying the child everything that he or she wants. Okay. I hear the uprising of the children who are listening to this podcast. (laughs) Boo, hiss. Yeah. Especially those that have really worked the system (laughs) and no matter where they go or what they see, their parents are getting them. And, you know, I think automatically our minds go to the toys, you know, buying the child the toy when you go into the store because the child wants the toy. But I think this is also ice cream or when you're at a restaurant buying that um, pop instead of going with water. Okay. For all of our non-Midwesterners, pop is soda or Coke. (laughs) Just to just to point that out, I knew as soon as I said it that there was going to be confusion. <laughs> yeah, I mean clothing, um, oh, clothing and, and, yeah. and gosh, think about how expensive this gets as they get older. Mm-hmm. I mean, electronics and all those things. I mean, you will be broke if you gave your kid everything they wanted. That clothing topic we're going to hit on here in just a second um, because I think you you said something very important. But let's continue with this thought, and then we're going to come mm-hmm. back to the clothing issue. But always giving your child what they want leads to the child believing that they have unlimited resources Mm -hmm. yeah, and that whatever they want is worth pursuing. Well, and I think it it gives this mistaken, (laughs) I hope it's a mistaken belief that whatever is my parents in terms of finances, Mm -hmm. time, energy is mine. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case. Well, let alone that whatever is my parents is God's. Mm. Yeah. So they totally miss that point. They totally miss the entire aspect of what we have, God has given us for his glory. Mm -hmm. And we are to use what he has given us to provide for our family's needs, not wants, needs, and to do God's work. Yeah. And it goes back to the point you made earlier, Heidi, that when we are giving in to instant gratification at every turn, Mm -hmm. we are negating the opportunity to to learn patience. That is part of the fruit of the spirit is patience and self-control. And so shame on us. And I'm, I'm talking to myself here for mm-hmm. um, the times that I have just given into that whim and, and bought the thing. And how easy that can happen. Yeah. So Melanie, this is a hot button topic, but I think it goes perfectly with this idea of buying a child everything he or she wants. And that is the topic of clothing. Um, I've had some conversations with people about clothing, especially with teenage daughters. And they say, well, my daughter dresses that way because that's how she wants to dress. Mamas, love your daughter enough to say no when she wants to buy clothing that does not protect. We're not helping our children by giving them everything they want. And I think this is a podcast in itself Mm -hmm. right here, Mm -hmm. but it is something that I think it begins when they are little by not giving them everything that they want. You're teaching them there are boundaries and you're teaching them to trust you in those boundaries. And then that baton is passed until they start seeing oh, this is why mom and dad spent money on this, or this is why mom and dad did not spend money on this. 
we will come back to this topic yeah. in another podcast. Yeah. Okay, next point um, for how to raise a selfish child would be rescuing the child from consequences of misbehavior. And this one clearly goes back to the other point about hardships, but um, this gets into a little more specifics about, um, you know, when, when you have a kiddo who never has experienced mm -hmm. the pain of a consequence, I mean, there's no way that kid's not going to end up as a selfish kid. Yeah. Did you read the book, The Whipping Child? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That was really popular when I was in mm -hmm. elementary school. I think it was a big award a winner. Mm -hmm. And the whole aspect of the book was that this rich child, I think he was a prince, maybe. I really don't remember all the details. But this rich child had a slave who received all the discipline and the punishment that that rich child should have received. Mm -hmm. He was the whipping boy. Mm -hmm. And I think that is exactly what happens in the 21st century. We just don't realize what we are doing when we do not allow a child to have, and I'm going to say allow, mm -hmm. allow a child to experience the consequences of misbehavior. We are passing it on to another person, to another time, whatever you want to say, we are passing it on, but that child will reap the negative. Yeah. I mean, and so as a small child, um, this may look like having to forego a dessert um, because of a, a poor choice. This may um, look like falling and skinning your knee because you told them not to wear the plastic high heels mm. out on the concrete. <laughs> I'm not saying that that happened or not in my house. Um, so those natural consequences um, that may or may not result in a physical injury, you know, clearly we're not suggesting that you put your child in harm's way Absolutely. or anything like that. But there are things to be said for when you feel the the pain of, um, of a mistake, you're less likely to repeat it. Right. Um, but like you said, Heidi, if we continue to protect... I mean, I just, I think about folks in the workplace that I, mm. that I have experienced who I know this was the case in their homes because they go about their business, um, with zero concern for how their decisions affect other people. Yeah. There's no understanding of cause and effect. Yeah. If I do a B is going to happen mm -hmm. because what I did was not loving to God and it was not loving to others. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's look at the last point. Setting no limits so the child can express, this is quote, express their creativity, end quote. Yikes. There is great fear in the 21st century that squashing a child's creativity, spirit, personality will break the child. Mm -hmm. And this is a very common one that I hear among parents. I hear it in teachers. Yeah. And I think this, this ties back into clothing in the teen mm -hmm. years, especially you know, middle school through teen years, because mm -hmm. that's, that's how I express myself. Mm -hmm. Mom is how I dress, you know, what I do with my hair and all that kind of stuff. But what is this based on? Mm -hmm. It's based on fear. Yep. It is the fear that the child won't be able to recover and won't be able to do great, amazing things. When in reality, Fear is not from God. No. And we know God is a God of boundaries. The Psalms are full of songs of praise to God for his boundaries. Um, and we as parents, that's part of our, our job, our vocation is to teach our kids that they can live an abundant, flourishing life within the boundaries that God provides. Boundaries are not negative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have to train our children to see those boundaries as safety. And those boundaries produce joy because you're not continually having to think about, well, what's going to happen if I do this or keeping up with lies. There is safety in obedience and obedience happens in firm boundaries. And I would just say, you know, it, it's also a, a measure of respecting others and respecting the things that God has given us. You know, when, when I read this initially, I thought of the child who was allowed to color all over the walls mm -hmm. and I, I can hear the pushback. Mm -hmm. I can hear it right now, but you know, my child is expressing herself mm -hmm. and no, they are defacing your home. Right. And so if, if we don't take care in these younger years to have those clear boundaries. Mm -hmm. Again, we're just, we're running the risk of 
of growing a human being and releasing a human being who believes that the world revolves around him or her. The boundaries are for other people, not me. Where I see this a lot with ABC Jesus Loves Me, when a child is given a craft project, the parents and teachers are torn between does the child need to create a similar craft project or is the child able to do whatever they want? And what I say to parents and teachers both is you have to decide what is the goal and the purpose in this activity. Because taking a craft project and placing part A under part B and then on top of part C, you know, following directions is very important. Mm -hmm. If your goal is for the child to be creative, then let the child know, I'm giving you this blank slate. You can do whatever you want on this piece of paper using crayons Mm -hmm. or using colored pencils. You're still having boundaries, but you're giving the child more freedom within those boundaries. But make sure you know, is this going to be an activity where we are going to follow and directions and follow um, authority? Or is this going to be something where there's more freedom? And you just said something so interesting where we follow authority. Mm -hmm. So parents, if you are um, Christians, if you're believing um, of of who God says you are as a follower of Jesus Christ, you submit to his authority. Mm -hmm. So if we are kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to our kids saying they can do whatever they want Mm -hmm. in the names of creativity, you're not being faithful to God, who is the supreme authority. You're negating your authority. It's just a very slippery slope. And I think we have to be really careful. And I think you said it so well, Heidi, is that we can articulate to our kids, this is an opportunity to do whatever you want to do. This is an opportunity here in this craft project to do process art. You're going to follow through on my instructions and we're going to get to see the outcome because you follow the instructions. So I love how you made that distinction. Thank you for clarifying that. These have been hard. And I personally have thought through, even though my kids are older, it looks different, but the selfishness is still there. And so it's caused me to look internally and really think about what am I doing that is allowing my child's selfishness. Mm -hmm. And Melanie, I'm going to say sin. Sure. There's sin to flourish. Yeah. The best first step is posture of confession, asking the Lord to forgive you for the ways that and I'm, I'm saying me here, the, asking mm-hmm. the Lord to forgive me for the ways that I've contributed to this. And asking the child to forgive yes, you. Yes, yes. That I have messed up. A lot of times we don't know how to begin. We see there's an issue, but we don't know how to begin. And it begins by sitting on the couch with your child and say, I Mm -hmm. have done wrong. I have gone to God for forgiveness. I am coming to you for forgiveness. And then establishing what are those new boundaries going to be? Right. Let them in on the fact that things Mm -hmm. are going to be different. Mm -hmm. And like it it might get a little bit rocky before it gets better, but I'm going to stick with it because I love you so much. And because I love God and I desire to obey him. Yeah. Now, Melanie, Let's say I'm a listener, I've listened to these six points, and I'm going, I have a very selfish child. Mm -hmm. What do I do? Well, first, I would say, you know, the the best first step is to acknowledge that there's a problem, That's right? exactly and correct. And so great. I'm so proud of you for even mm-hmm. hearing truth, mm-hmm. um, accepting truth. And so after you spent some time in prayer and just confessing to the Lord, please don't be overwhelmed. Pick one thing. Yes. And just kind of commit the next few weeks to uh, praying about this continually, talking with your spouse, getting a plan in action, and just focus on one thing. Don't try to fix a <laughs> Mm-mm. All the things at once. No, yeah. it's not going to work. Start with one, get successful at that, and then move to the next. Yeah. I would also encourage you to talk to a wise older woman mm-hmm. who has been there. Mm-hmm. Ask her for ideas. Mm-hmm. Look to see what she has done and ask for accountability. Yeah. And then cover all of this in prayer. Yeah. 
We want to thank you for listening to the Parenting to Impress podcast. Be sure to visit abcjesuslovesme.com and check out the show notes for more information on topics shared in this episode. Please subscribe and share with your friends.